Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Sean Butcher. Sean is the Chief Executive Officer of Progressive Franchising Partnerships. Welcome to the podcast, Sean. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate you inviting me, mate. Yeah, I've been looking forward to catching up. I uh, I have to admit, I find your uh, the sort of work you do in the industry um, you're in fascinating. I think it's uh, it has some massive challenges around 
building teams and um, and uh, from a HR perspective. And so I love chatting with leaders in your space. Um, but first of all, for our listeners, tell us about, uh, tell us what you do as CEO. Tell us about progressive franchising partnerships. Give us the sort of, um, yeah, the, the short story. Yeah, sure. Um, well, Progressive Franchising Partnerships, which has just come into existence in the last couple of days, actually, we've rebranded um, our former company, which was uh, Burrito Bar Franchising Corporation, and we've added some new brands over the last few years. So we're now a multi-brand franchisor. Uh, we've got 43 burrito bars. We've got six smoking burgers and ribs. Um, or six physical smoking burgers and ribs and 39 virtual smoking burgers and ribs and 11 Sweet Republic ice cream and dessert places. And we're about to launch uh, Hell Pizza from New Zealand in Australia as well. So yeah. I guess, wow. um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can, we, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and as I was saying before, I, I would love to ask some industry-specific questions because... Um, one of the fascinating things about your, you know, the, the work that you do and the, and, uh, you know, the, the sort of the teams that, that are involved uh, on the ground working at the diff for the different franchisees, um, and, and at your locations is I, I think for all of our listeners, even those who have had never had any sort of leadership role or work in, um, in food, in hospitality, in, um, in retail, there's sort of some overlap between some different industries there. But uh, we all are customers and we all frequent them. And I think, yeah, I, I just am always really, I always lean in. It's one of those industries where I'm always intrigued about how you do what you do. Because like I said, I think there are some unique challenges that some other industries don't have. And that always creates innovation. Um, so maybe we can get to that a bit later in the podcast. But um, more importantly uh, than the organization even, I, I would love to know a bit of your story, Sean. Let's start with... Uh, start at the beginning, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the sort of the, the season of your life when you were growing up, when you were, um, when you were just, uh, just a kid, can you reflect on that season of your life? Are there any moments or themes that really stand out to you, you know, from, from your sort of childhood that shaped you into the person and leader you are today? Yeah, sure. I guess, um, to be completely honest with you, I was never really interested in being a leader. Um, I wasn't a line leader at school. I wasn't interested in being a tuck shop leader, a library monitor, sports captain, student council, or anything like that, to be completely honest with you. What I was um, interested in, I guess, was making a difference. Um, and I guess as a young child, um, I, I really grew up in uh, what by Australian standards at least would be considered a um, pretty extreme level of poverty. Um, to the point where we were often homeless as kids. Um, we, um, you, you know, struggled for many years as part of a sole parent family. Um, after my mum uh, took off and um, took everything that my parents had and left my dad with a, a whole pile of debt and uh, two young kids. So working through that, um, I guess, at a young age was was quite difficult. You didn't quite understand as a young kid why you're poor and everybody isn't, why your Christmas gets cancelled and everyone else's doesn't, um, why you don't have a home and other kids do, why you're always moving around as your parent tries to find work um, or, or while you've got to hang out at their work while they do three different jobs. So a lot of that um, really resonated quite a lot with me as a young child. And, of course, uh, absolutely no disrespect to my father. Um, he, he did a tremendous job given the circumstance that he was left in, um, particularly given that that was the 80s and there was, no, there was no government support there, there was no free childcare, there was nothing like that. So working through that situation, um, he, he did a tremendous job, but... All you know as a kid is that this really sucks. Why am I the one who, you know, has got secondhand clothes and terrible shoes and why do I only get one haircut a year when all the other kids have very cool haircuts and why does the food that we have so horrible and basic and why isn't there enough of it? So you run all those things through your mind, I guess, as a kid. Um, 
And very early on, I became determined, I guess, that I wanted to make a difference, firstly to my situation, and then I wanted to ensure that, I guess, my kids and mm. um, the people that I cared about weren't in that situation themselves. Um, so that, that was a big driver for me. And I guess, um, yeah, the, the longer that went on, and, and particularly as you start to formulate more ideas as a child, you begin to become a little bit innovative in terms of the way you approach things, you look for opportunities, you look for ways to make your situation better. Um, and I mean, two of my earliest little ventures was in primary school, where I had a very successful little business doing other students' homework for them each day. Um, which um, they could pay me for in, in either food or money, depending on what uh, what their preference was. So I got a decent portion of other kids' tuck shop money each day in exchange for doing their homework, um, which definitely helped me. And then the other little business venture I had back then as well was um, I used to have to walk home uh, quite a long way each day from school because mm. um, we often didn't have a car that was working or couldn't afford petrol. And um, it didn't have enough money for bus fare a lot of the time either. So I used to walk past a lot of lolly shops on the way home. And a lot of the other kids, they got picked up by their parents. They got picked up on the bus. Um, and their parents were probably watching them fairly closely to make sure they didn't uh, gorge themselves on too many lollies. So I would um, I would fill that gap, essentially. <laughs> and um, once again, uh, kids would give me their tuck shop money. I'd buy their lollies on, on my walk home each day. I'd give them their lollies the next day. And they could either pay me in terms of uh, cash or they could pay me in terms of a commission uh, of the lollies. So <laughs> that was they were some of my earlier initiatives, <laughs> which um, uh, worked very well for me. I, I only got caught once. Um, but like any entrepreneur, I guess, I, um, I adapted, I evolved, <laughs> I changed my methodology and I didn't get caught twice. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I love so that, that you were you were working in the ultimate currency of uh, of childhood as well, which is, um, you know, for kids, which is lo- which is lollies, you know, or candy in other parts. Well, it's funny how it's just such a, oh, it's, um, you know, it's it's. It's just, uh, I, I just love that story. Thank you for sharing around um, around that part of your, your childhood. And, and I love, it's just one of my favorite things to hear uh, those sort of entrepreneurial stories because it, I find it just so remarkable that that kind of really, I mean, I hear, like you said, you know, being, being here in Australia as well, the extreme poverty that you, you know, not being able to pay for a bus, having to walk a long way home from school, that sort of stuff is and the way you you know the entrepreneur in sean came out at such a young age just i just i just love that um i want to i want to bring it straight to today and the way you lead today is there anything that you as you reflect now in how you lead you know the business and the businesses you know because there's like you said there's different um and i'm sure there's it's one group but you'd, you'd have slightly different approaches or strategies and um is there anything that you look at in how you lead them and you think, oh, yes, that I can link that directly to Sean growing up, some of that hardship, which would have been incredibly challenging at the time. And I can only imagine the resilience you must have from going through that. Um, is there anything that comes to mind in how you lead now that you can sort of link back? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think I'm I'm tremendously empathetic and almost sympathetic in a lot of ways to other people's situations. Um, yeah, I'm for me being in franchising, we're partnering with a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. They're investing their savings with us. They're taking out loans to come on board and be a partner with us, and and we're affecting their livelihoods. Um, you know whether they're kids have food today or, you know, whether their petrol has car, uh, sorry, their car has petrol or not is, is largely dependent upon how successful we are as a franchise in supporting them, giving them the tools they need and and really making sure that they are successful in their business. Um, and I've certainly walked into a few franchises, particularly as a consultant over time, where things weren't necessarily going well. And within that, you have a franchisee behind every one of those stores who probably has a family, may have partner, kids, um, extended responsibilities. And uh, our commitment and our 
resolve to making sure that they're successful needs to be 100%. Otherwise, the, the flow-on effects can be huge. And, um, you know, likewise, when you when you step into a franchise, and I've got to be honest with you, Jono, when I first started with this company, they were in all sorts of trouble. Um, and I had, uh, I met the franchisees. There was 30 sites left at that stage. We were closing a lot um, before I arrived. And I met with a lot of the franchisees and, and most of them were crying, um, which it, it's a heartbreaking thing to see. Um, and especially when you step in as the franchisor and you go, well, how do I make this situation better for this person? How can we improve the situation? Um, because behind every business partner or franchise partner, um, you know, is somebody who, you know, is going to be devastated if this doesn't work out. So every single one of these sites that we have um, has to be successful. It has to succeed um, because somebody's, you know, potentially life savings, family, hopes, dreams, um, sense of self-esteem, everything else is on the line, more so than if we were just... Uh, a big corporation that everyone was an employee. Um, sure, if people lose their jobs, that's that's certainly devastating, but uh, nowhere near as devastating as if a franchisee loses their business. So that's, that's the approach we take, um, and, and we're 100% and our no resolve for that. Um, no franchisees left here. Um, during the time that I've been here, broke or destitute, um, sure, people... People sell, franchisees sell, and we're very happy when they can get a good price for their business. That's great. Um, they've built up some equity. They've, they've made some good money in the meantime, and then they've sold their business. That's wonderful. But we certainly never want to be one of these um, franchisees that I guess you might see on a current affair sometimes where, um, you know, a franchisee is talking about how they invested, you know, half a million dollars and they lost everything and now they're homeless and uh, life is horrible. So... That's that's probably the biggest uh, the biggest way that's affected me. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because uh, this idea of empathy has come up a lot with uh, with with my um, you know other guests. I'm at around two hundred episodes as we record this, and and I've learnt so much chatting with leaders from all around the world. And one of the most yeah, I'm always looking for patterns, and definitely that idea of empathy, that ability to step into someone else's shoes to sit across from them and not only to understand but to actually be able to have the relationship where they 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 truly feel that you understand them that's a game changer and i can hear that that's obviously something that um like you talked about that that you have i want to ask you something that's come up as well in the podcast a lot sean is people who have had more challenging childhoods in, in lots of different parts of the world for lots of different reasons. I'm always fascinated by their perspective. And I just want to ask you, when something like COVID happens, when you've when you've run into any big challenges as a leader, have you noticed that you have a bit of a different perspective, that maybe some things that shake other people who might have had a, a different childhood might have, for them, it, maybe it was really comfortable. And so this sort of challenge is really the first time they've experienced a big challenge that life's really thrown at them. Is that something you've noticed? Yeah, I, I think it definitely builds some resilience um, in terms of what you've gone to pre, gone through previously. Um, I think that's definitely a huge part of it. And, and I think that once again, you know, flows into the empathy aspect that you were talking about before. You, you understand what's really on the line. Um, and it's if you've been to those places that aren't so pleasant and you've experienced those things that aren't so great, you, you can almost sense when something like COVID might be sending everybody straight back down that, particularly in business and particularly in the hospitality sector, which... Um, uh, unfortunately copped a hell of a beating um, during the, the COVID lockdowns and all the restrictions to the point where, you know, a lot of independent operators, I guess, that didn't have the support that we're able to provide as a franchise, they they closed, they lost everything. Um, and when you know what that feels like and you know where you could be going um, or you know where your franchisees could be going, um, you you fight that much harder to stop, stop it ever getting to that point. Yeah, absolutely. That's um, really well said. 
Well, as we fast forward in your life um, from those sort of first years, I want you to think back to one of your first leadership opportunities. Like you said, you weren't so much chasing the, you know, the leadership roles in school, so to speak, or for you, it was about making a difference, um, which, which I love. But I want you to think whether it was in your 20s, whether it was um, later than that, whether it was in your teens, can you think of a time uh, that was one of your first leadership opportunities where you really uh, sort of hit a wall, where you had to break through something, where you felt out of your depth, where you had to learn some new skills, um, where you were sort of felt found out as a leader. A lot of leaders talk about imposter syndrome, and I think the first time a lot of uh, a lot of people experience that is when you go, "Oh my goodness, okay, um, can I actually do this?" Um, to these people, you know, whoever's whoever <laughs> I'm reporting to, do they? Uh, do they know that you know that I am who I am and I'm giving this a go? What comes to mind? Yeah, look, um, probably the first real leadership opportunity, and I guess the time where I saw that um, as an opportunity to make a difference was when I was about maybe sixteen. Um, I was working; I'd been working in a pizza franchise at that time, and um, I. I was working basically full time. I was working really hard. I was learning quickly, and this this is the '90s, mind you. People didn't, um, I guess, have the restrictions that they have these days. But um, the boss there offered me the opportunity to start running some shifts, um, which was which I was very excited about. Um, seemed like a great idea. Um, uh, that would be my first opportunity, and the first night of that opportunity uh, actually turned into a huge disaster. <laughs> but um, um, that that would be the first, and I guess um, yeah, uh, that led on to other things. Led on to you know a store manager's position, an area manager's position, me buying my first two businesses uh, shortly after that as well. Okay, I have that to was ask, probably where it all started. You, you, um, you left it hanging. So, what happened on that first night that was so disastrous? Yeah, I realised after I said that I probably should have left that out, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, <laughs> you don't, you don't yeah. Have to, what, um, what happened? Go into details, if you don't want. No, no, I'll go into detail. What the hey? Uh, <laughs> no, what uh, what happened? Uh, I don't know if you've ever looked inside a, a pizza store, Jono, too closely, but um, you'll you'll notice they've got these big conveyor belt ovens that um, essentially the lifeblood of the the pizza store. You make the pizzas at one end, you put them in the conveyor belt, and um, they go through and they cook nicely. But uh, my first shift, I'd, I'd gotten in there super early. I'd gotten really organised. I had a really good plan. I had everything in place, um, was ready to go. And we, we were going extremely well during the middle of, I think, maybe a Friday night, which is kind of like the busiest night of the week. But um, partway through, the um, the ovens actually crashed. Um, their conveyor belts were still going, but there was no heat coming out. So we had, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 pizzas every couple of minutes coming out of the oh conveyor belt goodness. ovens that were uncooked. Um, so that was um, a, a massive problem <laughs> in a pizza store, which about five minutes after that led to a massive problem with customer complaints and people wanting to know where their food was and why their food wasn't being cooked and uh, everything like that. So we, um, we, we had that situation there and uh, we had to deal with that. Uh, we couldn't get the ovens restarted. We were doing everything we could, which is basically, <laughs> I guess, what most people know, which is turning things off and turning them back on again and playing with the knobs and the dials and doing all of that. And then we started frantically trying to call neighbouring uh, res- uh, neighboring stores um, and find out uh, if they knew what was going on and area managers and any phone number we could get. We couldn't actually get anybody, unfortunately, um, because everybody was busy. It was the middle of a Friday night. Yeah. So after we'd um, basically refunded thousands of dollars worth of orders, called all our delivery customers and told them they wouldn't be getting their food tonight and been through all of that and copped all the abuse and the anger and the frustration of people whose meals were going to be delayed, um, eventually after that, um, one of our neighbouring stores, uh, a franchisee there called Bob, he was about 60 years of age, nice guy, but... Uh, sort of typical Australian guy, Um, very basic in his approach and very straight to the point, called back and um, he he told us that, look, if you climb behind the back of the ovens, you'll actually find a a hidden reset switch to manually ignite the ovens. 
and that will get them going for you again. So he told us that. Um, we did that. It worked. I, I came back to him on the phone, thanked him for that, and then I guess in exasperation I was uh, essentially telling him, look, this, this is a disaster. This is my first shift. I'm going to lose my job. Um, we've got thousands of dollars worth of refunds we've just had to give out in the last sort of 45 minutes. Um, the number of complaints is going to be massive. I'm doomed. Um, life as I know it is over. Um, and I basically asked him, you know, what on earth do I do? You've been around. What do I tell these guys? What, how, do I, how do I defend myself against what's happened tonight? And, and as I said, Bob was very straight to the point and he, he stayed silent for a little bit. And then he basically said to me, well, he did say to me, um, well, you're effed. Um, and he didn't censor himself, of course. <laughs> um, and, of course, you can imagine my response. I'm already stressed out of my brain and I'm thinking, well, that is the most useless piece of advice I've ever gotten in my life. I'm going to politely thank you and hang up right now. But I didn't say that. I just sat there in stunned silence for, for a few seconds, what probably felt like minutes, but... Bob actually added to that afterwards, and it's probably one of those, you know, I know you talk about aha moments um, a lot in your podcasts, but uh, he, he said to me after that, he said, but you're going to come back tomorrow and you're going to do it better. And at the time, I didn't really appreciate that. I, I kind of, you know, once again, th thank you very much, Bob, really appreciate your time. I've got to go, mate. Have a nice night. But I, I thought a lot more about that as, as the night rolled on. Um, and it was probably a sleepless night as well. But um, I, I thought he, in, in his simplicity, he was actually 100% right. It, it was effed. It was as bad as it could possibly be. It was the ultimate disaster. There, there was no getting away from that. Um, but what I had to do was just own that, accept that, and be resolute in my determination to move on and improve from that. Um, so uh, next day, of course, I'm copying the grilling of all grillings. And mm. by and large, I was able to shut it down pretty quickly by saying, yep, yeah, it's, it's the biggest disaster I've ever seen. It's the biggest disaster you've ever seen. It happened. I know I can do better. Give me the opportunity and I'll prove it to you. Yeah. Um, and that's something I guess I've carried with me a, a, a long time is uh, sometimes you've just got to admit it just hasn't worked. It has failed. Yeah. It is bad. It is, it is a disaster. But that's not the end point unless you choose to make it the end point. If mm. you learn from that and move on and move on quickly to something better, um, it, it, it does improve and you can recover from that no matter what it is. Um, and I, I find, particularly as I've gone on in business, you know, there's a lot of time, and, and like yourself, John, I've, I've spent a fair bit of time doing consultancy, a lot of the time to companies that are in trouble and not going so well. And they're very busy defending the undefendable or, or trying to find the reason why a failed strategy or a failed approach or a failed method of doing something is actually right um, when you're wasting time um, you've, you've just got to admit that that's bad. I'm going to take whatever learnings I can from it and move on. And, and that worked for me. And I've carried that piece of advice with me forever uh, <laughs> since. <laughs> and it's often something I give out to other people as well, is that you just, you just got to call it as it is and move on. Yeah, that's so good. I think um, just, just facing reality. I mean, that's what I love about Bob's um, not necessarily soft, uh, soft approach there, but in, in those sort of moments, I think it is. Um, I think it is helpful to have that combination of reality check. You know, I, I love that idea of the facing the brutal facts of reality that Jim Collins talks about in um, in Good to Great. And really, I imagine when you're going in and working with a um, a business that's struggling, I, I can imagine that, that sometimes there may be a little bit of a lack of attention to some brutal facts and. Um, and that's a starting point, right? Is actually going, you know what? This is the deadline. This is the time frame. This is how long you've got left unless we change things. And, and you know, um, but yep. what you did that I love in that situation is, you know, uh, the next day you turned up, you, you, uh, you know, hit it, uh, you know, with full on without excuses to say, yeah, that was, that was horrible. Um, what a nightmare, you know, and, 
and you brought the confidence to say, um, I'm going to learn from that and, and, um, and do better. And I think that combination is really powerful, yeah. that confidence. But, um, but in any sphere of life, if people don't own up to that, it's a real, leaves a real bad taste in your mouth if you're involved. If someone gives excuses and doesn't actually say, you know what, I really, oh, I really dropped the ball there. That was bad. It, it does. And I think, I mean, in, a, in any sort of leadership position too, I think you've got to make it a safe space really for people to own up to those things and, and be honest with you. Um, cause too often, I think there's, there's a pressure to find an excuse or find a reason or find a silver lining on everything and just don't want to see the, don't want to see the bad stuff. Don't want to see the negatives. Don't want to see the mistakes. But I think if you make it a safe space for people and you realize, look, if you admit something's stuffed up, if something's gone bad, something didn't work the way you thought it would, um, then that's okay. Um, you've just got to learn from that and move on. I mean, there's there's so many stories about, you know, entrepreneurs out there who, you know, first business ventures, they didn't go so well. Second business ventures didn't go so well. Um, You know, it's it's a pretty remarkable person that gets everything right 100% the first time. I've never met that person yet. So I certainly don't (laughs) expect them to be working here or to be our franchise partners either. So (laughs) if you make it a safe space, you can stop wasting time on, uh, you know, unproductive, um, uh, what would you call it? Uh, deflection. Um, yeah, and, and get get to the heart of the matter really quickly. I think that's um, it's such a funny balance as well because it, yeah, when you're in the shoes of the person leading up, you know, it can really feel like the last thing in the world your leader wants to hear is the bad news or is the I dropped the ball. But it, it it's. And it's actually recognizing that, you know what, unless they're in, unless you have an incredible leader who's extremely emotionally intelligent, they probably will react negatively. And um, that's that, you know, ideally you have a great leader who handles that really well and says, you know what, let's let's look at this rationally. <laughs> you know, but sometimes they will um, lose the plot a little bit at first, and uh, but it's still worth not just, like you said, deflecting excuses, actually face it and then move on with confidence. Um, yeah, sure. and, and the moving on is really important. It's it's the most important thing, I think, is what is that plan B? What does that look like now? And, and how do we keep moving forward? Yeah, so good. I'd love to have you back for another episode. I feel like um, there's a bunch of questions I want to ask um, around aha moments and mentors. Uh, but I don't want to squish them into a couple of minutes. So if you're interested, maybe down the track in a few months or something, there's no no rush, but it'd be great to do a part two. Um, and uh, and maybe we can explore some yeah, of those questions to. I haven't gotten to. Awesome. Yeah, well, definitely let's, love to. Man. Let's I'll start landing the, the plane for today with some Leadership Express questions. And the first one I want to ask you about is a book. What's a book that you've gifted to other people or recommended a lot? Yeah, probably the big one in our industry is um, by a guy called Greg Nathan, who I think he probably came off the arc with Noah. He's been around for so long. But he wrote a book called Profitable Partnerships, which um, is all about how uh, to manage that relationship between franchisors and your franchise partners or franchisees, whatever they're called in different companies, um, how to manage those relationships in a much more productive um and partnership orientated approach than was the case when he first started coming out. When he first started coming out with this stuff, he was, um, the franchising approach back then was very much um, to the franchisees was give us your money and sit there, shut up and do what we say. And that was the way franchising was done in the eighties. And he really probably more than anyone started to change that approach to make it a much more equal partnership and a partnership where, um, you know, both parties were productively involved. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. Uh, Great recommendation. Thank you. Love an industry-specific recommendation. Let's stay on um, industry-specific and let's talk about franchisors and um, franchise partners, as you said. Uh, what's What's one of the biggest challenges problems that you're seeing uh, for franchisors, for franchise partners, uh, for people out there who might be considering getting into 
uh, to either be a franchisor um, or to be a franchise partner? What's one of the biggest challenges or problems you're seeing for leaders in your space? Geez, yeah, the, the, the challenges are very different. I mean, for franchisors, I, I guess the challenge is always what you're essentially working with is taking people who are usually either slightly embedded in the industry or sometimes doing a complete industry change partway through their career, partway through their life to the point where you might be a carpenter or an IT professional one day and then you decide you want to be a restaurateur the next um, so the systems, the procedures, the training, the support, the communication and everything you do with that person has to be so much more supportive, specialised and responsive to their needs than what it would be if we were 100% company owned operations where people come up through the ranks and they've been working for us for years before they become a manager. And that's not just our situation, that's with all franchising. Franchising is essentially based around giving people that opportunity and that support to do something that they might want to do, but not necessarily have had the career uh, to enable them to do that, or at least not with confidence. So how you manage that and support that is definitely the biggest challenge for franchisors. Um, For franchisees, I think it's a matter of making sure that the franchise or that you're looking to partner with really has your best interest at heart. Um, There's, as you're no doubt aware, obviously here in Australia, there's some negative media stories that pop up from time to time with franchisors who have um, maybe not um, been as great as they probably could have been. Um, They are the minority, but Obviously, nobody wants to be stung by that minority. So for franchisees, they've really got to do their research and make sure they understand that network. Talk to the existing franchisees in that network, you know, really get to the bottom of it because that's your business partner. You're you're getting into partnership with somebody and like any partnership, it can be difficult to exit if you decide it's not right for you later on. So that's that's probably the really key note to franchisees there. Yeah, that's great. And isn't it funny how even, um, and this is pretty much every every challenge that comes up, both of those are people related, right? When it comes to being a franchisor, it's about the relationship with your franchise partners and, and understanding how to really do that well and different to how it might have been done, say, Back in back in the eighties, uh, you know, before it was treated as a really equal partnership, and then if you're a franchise partner, it's actually about um, s- stopping and really doing your due diligence. Not necessarily about the um, the financial side, which is well, you know that's valid, but actually going, okay, this person's going to be my business partner, <laughs> or this this group's going to be my business yep. partner. What are they really like to work with? How supportive are they? What yep. what's their real sort of underlying goal? I think that's wonderful advice, but it, it's funny how both comes back to relationships, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. And it's where franchising has gone bad um, in, in very specific cases. It's, it's when that relationship completely breaks down. When you have a situation where the franchisees are hostile towards the franchisor or the franchisor is hostile towards the franchisees, it, it becomes completely unwel- uh, unworkable. Um, so you're absolutely right. It is a relationship, and and that's really the foundation of it. And if parties can't work together, there's there's really no hope. Absolutely. Um, what about a great piece of advice? Can you think of a great piece of advice you've received in life or leadership at some point? Yeah. Um... I, I guess the thing I come back to all the time, and probably the advice that. I I try and give out to a lot of people is particularly people that I work with is is that we need to keep keep our focus on the real results and what we're really here to achieve. I think um, too often people get distracted by a subset of KPIs that they've created for themselves or something that really isn't what they're there to achieve. And for us, our our primary purpose, our, our primary reason for being is to make sure that each and every one of our franchisees is successful in business and everything else flows from that. I mean, we've doubled the number of restaurants we've got in the last couple of years because 
our franchisees are happy. They're making money. They're opening more restaurants. They're bringing their friends. They're bringing their families. But at the end of the day, if we weren't getting them the results that they wanted, it doesn't matter how great we think our menus are or how great our logo is or how great we think our marketing is. All of that leads towards a set of results that we need to get. And I think that's that's not just for companies as well. That's for, you know, I've worked in education. Um, you know, I've, I've consulted to the not-for-profit sector. Um, whatever you're there to achieve, if, if you're in the not-for-profit sector and your goal is to support at-risk youth, then you need to be really 100% focused on making sure each and every one of those youth that you come into contact with is left better off. If you're feeding the homeless, you need to use your resources to feed as many homeless people as you can. If you're a teacher, you need to get the best educational results you can for your students. Um, But I think more and more over time, people get distracted by a whole subset of KPIs that are often easier to achieve, more ambiguous, um, and not really what the organisation has set out to achieve. Yeah, that's such great advice. And I think we it's so easy to listen to that and go, but isn't that obvious? But you're right, in the busyness of um in the busyness of the day to day in any role. Um and it's funny you mentioned about consulting. I've found this so much um uh, in my work with teams and with organizations is so often it's the it's the simple questions that open these sort of conversations that really do lead to a lot of transformation because people go, what are we trying to achieve? Um, or, or, you know, the sort of the, the follow-up question and how will we know when we get there? Those sort of questions sound like, mm. well, that's ridiculous. But you know, sometimes that, you know, you have a four hour discussion after that to really go, well, but what are we trying to achieve? <laughs> because we're trying to achieve these six different things. And what's the main thing? Um, and, uh, and that sounds yeah. like a simple answer, but particularly when you've got a team of people thinking differently, that's a, that's a game changer. So yeah, I love that. That's great advice. I absolutely agree. I think it's worth coming back to that all the time. And I know we try to come back to that all the time. Everything needs to lead towards that purpose, but I understand how people get distracted. There's so much theory out there today. The nature of business is so complex, more complex than it's ever been before. The nature of any organisation is more complex than it's ever been before. So there's a lot of things to get distracted with and tied down with in the day-to-day, I think. Absolutely. Well, last question as we land. This has just been so much fun. I could keep going, but I am watching the clock. Last question. If you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say to them? Yeah, I'd probably come back to what I just said before, John. I think really just stay focused on the results. Um, Stay focused on what you're meant to be achieving. Everything else should lead towards that outcome. I think if you can do that, then you'll you'll be quite successful in what you do. Yeah, that's great advice, uh, Sean. Thank you for sharing that. For those who've really enjoyed today and, um, you know, for those as well who might be uh, any any Aussies who are listening going, hmm, actually, Sean could be a pretty good guy to uh, to potentially partner <laughs> with, <laughs> which I'd be really happy if, uh, if that was, uh, you know, that happened as well. That's always a bonus um, to support guests any way I can. But um, how can people connect with you online, wherever they are and, and however they'd like to? Yeah, sure. Um, well, me personally, I'm on LinkedIn, um, Sean Butcher, S-H-A-U-N and B-U-T-C-H-E-R. Um, our brands all have websites at the moment. Um, our main company, Progressive Franchising Partnerships, should be live online within a few days. So, um, yeah, e- either through LinkedIn or Burrito Bar, Smoking Burgers and Ribs, Sweet Republic or Hell Pizza. Um, or progressive franchising partnerships um, within a few days. Brilliant. Well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. Such a great episode uh, from Sean, just sharing really vulnerably about, um, you know, the context growing up and, and just some amazing entrepreneurial stories 
uh, involving uh, lollies and uh, buses, and I just love that and <laughs> to see what he's doing now. That was that was one of my highlights. Um, don't forget, for our listeners, I also have the John O. White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day Podcast, two other places you can go to continue to invest in your leadership. But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Sean, for being so generous with your time. Um, in, a, in a busy time of year over here, end of financial years um, just uh, just <laughs> happened here in, in Australia, so it is busy. Um, but, yeah, it's been a real joy to spend time with you. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, thank you for having me, John. I really appreciate what you're doing here. I think it's, it's great for people to have these discussions and um, uh, listen to other people who've been through it, especially as they're trying to find their feet as a leader. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O'White, or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process 
that I unpack in Step Up or Step Out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time. 